morning we are continuing in Mark's gospel. If you would turn, if you'd like to follow along in the reading of the scriptures, turn to Mark chapter 12. Mark's gospel is the second book in the New Testament. The second of four gospels that uh, begin the New Testament. I already mentioned earlier, we're currently looking at that exchange uh, between the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, his opponents as he has entered into Jerusalem. They understand something of who Jesus claims to be, and they're doing everything they can to try to discredit him, to try to make him look foolish, say something foolish, or do something that would be against their law so that they can arrest him and turn him over to the Romans or perhaps judge them by their own law. But of course, Jesus escapes every time with the wisest answers. This morning, we see him uh, ask them a question that leaves them somewhat dumbfounded and unable to ask any further questions. And that has to do, of course, with who this son of David is. But let's read that passage, first of all, in Mark chapter 12, verses 35 through 37. And Jesus answering began to say as he taught in the temple, How is it that the scribes say that, that the Christ is the son of David? David himself said in the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. David himself calls him Lord. And so in what sense is he his son? And the great crowd enjoyed listening to him. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, let me just remind you, last time we saw something that was extremely important uh, to our well-being as Christians and even, of course, in sharing the gospel with others. Everyone needs to understand what the greatest commandment is. The last time we saw a particular scribe. And remember, the scribes were the ones who copied the scriptures. They're the ones who studied the scriptures. They were the ones who knew the scriptures just about better than anyone else in Israel. A particular scribe came up to Jesus and asked him a question. Jesus recognized from his question that this man was intelligent, more so than the others, somebody who had, in fact, been looking at the scriptures and discovered what God was really after behind all these commandments. And he asked Jesus an educated question. What is the greatest commandment? And Jesus' answer agreed with his assessment. To love the Lord your God with all of your hearts and all your minds, all your soul and all your strength. And the second one, which is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on, really, on these two commandments depend everything God says in the law and everything he says in the prophets. This is greater than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices, than all the ceremonies that God had required, and more so than anything else that we might want to offer to the Lord. And the reason is because this is what God is really after in all that he commands. I think you probably heard me say something about that already this morning. This is his goal in redemption. This is the reason why he, he saved us or saved anyone was that we might do this. We came into the world going the wrong direction. We came into this world hating God. Hating our neighbor. Now, we may not necessarily think that that's what we're doing, but the Bible says we were. Everything that we do is all self-centered. Everything we do is for our benefit, even when we try to benefit someone else. We certainly were not loving them in the way that God called us to, and certainly our relationship with God was that of hatred. But Jesus came to reverse all of this. Jesus came to show us the right way, of course, by way of example. And he lived a perfect life of love towards his father and love towards his neighbor. But he also came to give us the power to do this by his Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that that is what the Lord does. He changes hearts. When Jesus told the Pharisees, clean out the inside of the cup and the outside will be clean as well. Clean out the inside of the tomb, as it were, and the outside will become beautiful as well. We have to be clean from the inside, and that's something that only the Lord can do. And by the way, that's also how we can know that we have actually trusted Jesus Christ savingly, is when our lives begin to express this kind of love. When we actually do love the Lord in this way, 
when we do love our neighbors, as a matter of fact, even when we love our enemies, because the Lord tells us that we need to love our enemies as well. And not just in any way, but in the way that he commands us. Now, we understand from Scripture that even uh, the most devout Christians, even those most filled with the Holy Spirit, aren't going to be able to do this perfectly by any means. We're all going to fail in many ways. But that will be our desire. That will be our goal in life. We'll be grieved when we fail to do this. But still, God put it in our hearts, and that is the direction, that will be the direction of our lives. That is the purpose of redemption. But I want you to remember also something Jesus pointed out when he spoke to this particular scribe. He said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of heaven when he saw that he had answered intelligently. And that reminds us that, that knowing that these things are true is not enough. And even agreeing with them is not enough to save us. I mean, the scribe knew, the scribe agreed with Jesus. He wasn't far from the kingdom of heaven, but he wasn't in the kingdom of heaven either. And the reason why he wasn't was because he hadn't actually trusted Jesus Christ. He hadn't received him as his Savior and Lord. He did not believe necessarily that he was the Messiah. And that's because he did not have the Spirit of God. If he had, then he would have loved Jesus as the Lord calls him to. So again, this is a warning to each one of us to make sure that we not only know what the scriptures say, we not only agree that what it says is true, but that we have this love in our heart towards God and toward our neighbor, which we can only have by trusting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's what the Lord means when he says, or what Paul meant when he said to the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. He didn't mean just believe it's true, but he said trust in the Savior and he will give you life. He will transform your life and you will know that you are his when your life is transformed. But now Jesus, as he has been fielding these particular questions, had a question for them. And his question had to do with a statement that David made in the Old Testament. He asked this question, how can the Christ be David's son when David himself calls him Lord? Now I hope you understand that uh, to the Jewish mind and really in, should be to our mind as well, this isn't something just the Jews thought of, but something that God had actually inculcated in their culture. The father is always greater than the son. That's why we have the, uh, the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Instead of reading instead, parents honor your children, uh, that's not the way it works. The parent is greater in authority because the parents come before the child, because it's from the parents the child gets their existence. It's because the child gets their subsistence, you know, they, their livelihood, they're, they're, they're supported by their parents. And so the Lord tells the children to honor their parents. Well, that's exactly what David should do for his son, or that the son should do for David, because he is the son of David. And yet, David, in the spirit, calls the one who is his son, his Lord. Why is that the case? Well, you know what? They didn't know how to answer that question. And it isn't mentioned here, but it is in a parallel passage in one of the other gospels in Matthew that after Jesus asked this question, no one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. And actually, there weren't that many more days before they actually crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. The Jews did not understand who the Messiah was to be. They knew he was to be the son of David. They appeared to think that uh, God would raise up another son of David who would legitimately be able to sit on the throne of David, ruling Israel, and as the ruler of Israel would lead Israel against the Romans and free them from Roman tyranny. They didn't understand that this one was going to be much greater than just an ordinary man, that he was going to be much more than just another son of David, that his authority and his kingdom would be far more reaching than just Israel. 
So this morning, I want us to consider three things. I want us to consider that Jesus is the son of David. He is the fulfillment of that promise. But that he is much more than just the son of David. He is the son of God. And so thirdly, has a much greater kingdom than simply Israel. And as Christians, we understand that. But I want us to see some of the implications of that as well. Now, first of all, Jesus is the son of David. I think you know that after the fall of man, after Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God in the garden, God immediately intervened with his mercy and his grace. Otherwise, he could have very justly destroyed Adam and Eve for their rebellion, and he could have destroyed the world and scrapped everything. But that wasn't his plan. His plan was to allow, of course, the human race to, to multiply and fill the planet and to save from that vast multitude of people, a people for his own possession. Remember how the son of David was going to build this house of the Lord. Well, because of that, the Lord intervened immediately, as I've said, with his grace. He did make a couple of animal sacrifices, and he clothed or covered over the nakedness or the shame or the sin of Adam and Eve with these animal sacrifices. He also made a promise to Eve that someday her seed would crush the head of the serpent. In other words, through childbearing, somewhere down the line, one would come into the world who would do a work that would actually put an end to the work that Satan had just done in order to destroy the human race. So he would be the seed of the woman. As time goes on, the Lord makes a promise to Abraham, and he says, through your seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And so he's narrowing down that family through whom Messiah is going to come through the line of Abraham. And then, as you know, as we've just read in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the Lord narrowed it down even a little bit more so into the line of David. He would be a son of David. And God said he was going to establish this particular son of David and his throne forever. Now, the Jews were aware of that prophecy, and they knew that the Messiah was going to come through the line of David. But they didn't think about it the way they should have. Perhaps they thought God had promised an unbroken line of succession to the throne of Israel, and that even if that line was broken, which is it was during the days of um, when Jesus Christ comes into the world, there hadn't been a son of David on the throne for, I believe, 10 generations. Even if that line was broken, God would raise another son of David up, and he would restore that throne indefinitely. But what the Lord really meant by that was that he would raise up a particular son of David who would be Jesus Christ, and that this one would be, again, as we were going to see, more than just the son of David. But it, this was not a promise of an unbroken succession all the, th- all the way through, but it was the promise of a particular son, and that would be Jesus Christ. By the way, that's the reason why the Gospel of Matthew was written. It was written to the Jews to prove to them that Jesus was the promised seed of Abraham and he was the promised seed of David. As a matter of fact, the very opening words of the gospel point us in that direction. This is how it begins. The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This is the one that we're waiting for. This is the one who fulfills the scriptures. This is the king of Israel. This is the king of the world. And this is the savior of Israel and of all who will trust in him. Jesus has the right to the throne of Israel. Now, there was no question that the Messiah was going to be the son of David. But the real question is, and it's the question that Jesus puts to these, um, uh, to these Pharisees and scribes and elders, how can Jesus be the son of David and yet be greater than David? Well, this brings us to the second point, that he is more than just a son of David. He is the Son of God. Now, the Lord showed his people in the Old Testament, as I pointed out before, this prophecy from 2 Samuel 7. The Messiah is going to be a son of David and have the right to his throne. The Lord was showing them through the years in the Old Testament, through repeated prophecies and so forth, just exactly who Messiah would be. 
but they apparently missed the most important part of who he was, that he would be God in human flesh, more specifically the Son of God in human flesh. Now, it's easy for us to be critical of the Jews since we look at the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament, and we have a full explanation of what this is, you know, so it's a little bit easier for us to see it. And yet, it was very clearly revealed to the Jews. For example, the Jews knew where Jesus Christ was going to be born. Remember when uh, the, uh, uh, the wise men came from the east and they came to Herod and they said, where is this, this one that's born the king of the Jews? We've seen his star and we've followed it to here. And Herod didn't know, so he called for the, the chief priests and the scribes and he says, where is the Christ to be born? And they said, well, in Bethlehem. Because that's exactly what the scripture says in Bethlehem in Judea, Micah's prophecy. And yet that same prophecy says that this one who was to be born was himself eternal, Micah 5, 2. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth from me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. This one who was the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. They understood that well enough, but they missed this other part that he would be eternal. They also knew that Messiah was going to rule on the throne of David, as we've already seen in 2 Samuel chapter 7, but also in Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. It says here that he would, but it also says there would be no end to the increase of his government, and it tells us who this one was. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Now again, I want you to note that Isaiah tells us clearly who this one was going to be, on whose shoulder the government would rest, and who would rule on the throne of David. That his name would be Wonderful Counselor, that his name would be Mighty God. How can they miss the fact that this one who was coming was God? And that he would be the eternal father, or more literally, the father of eternity. This is not the father who was coming, into human flesh. The Bible says God sent his son into the world, not the father. But this is the father of eternity, or again, as we saw in Micah, the one who is eternal. Now, perhaps they couldn't really conceive how the Messiah could be both the son of man and the son of God, but if they had understood this, the answer to Jesus' question might be easier. They might have been able to answer, well, of course, David's son is going to be greater because he is God in human flesh. And so he is much greater than David. Now, they must have understood something, at least, of what Jesus was saying when he said this, because later on, he is, they're going to ask him this question. When he's put on trial, the high priest is going to ask him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And when he says yes, they will accuse him of blasphemy. Now, after Jesus asked this question, they weren't willing to ask him any more questions because they understood the implications of this. They did not understand the scriptures. They were putting, uh, being put to shame by Jesus over and over again. They were trying to get him to lose favor with the people. But as a result, the people were delighting in listening to him because he answered correctly. He answered wisely. He answered all their questions while they ended up with mud on their faces. But again, they didn't understand who the Messiah was to be. And it makes a huge difference who he is. So let's move on to the implications of this. Since he is more than merely a son of David, his kingdom is going to be much larger than Israel. Now what did David mean when he wrote this? Again, this is the passage that he's referring to in order to prove who Messiah is, that he is much greater than David. He says, the Lord says to my Lord, 
Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. What does that mean? And when is the Lord intending to fulfill this? Now, up until this point, by the way, I should mention that it is important that you understand who Jesus Christ is because if the Jesus Christ that you're trusting in is not the Son of David, if he's not the Son of God, if he's not God in human flesh, if he's not the Son of God in human flesh, then you're not trusting in the true Jesus. It's important for you to trust in the right one to save you. That's the only way you can be saved. But here we want to get into a little bit more application of what his office and his position and his authority means for you and me as Christians. So what does this mean? What is this passage referring to? When is the Lord going to fulfill this particular prophecy? Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Well, if you've been in broad evangelical churches today, you'll know that most churches believe, and by the way, we call those uh, the, the sort of the majority view today is called dispensationalism. They believe that this passage is going to be filled, fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. And that's going to happen after Jesus Christ returns, after he raptures his church, after he deals with Israel for seven years. After this, he's going to set up a kingdom that's going to last for a thousand years. And that's when Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign with his saints and that's when these enemies are going to be subdued. They believe this prophecy, the one that, that I've read out of Psalm 110, verse 1 and 2, and this one that's quoted by Jesus, that this prophecy is pointing to that particular time because that's when they believe that his rule is going to begin. But I want you to understand that this rule that the Lord is referring to here has already begun that Jesus is already ruling, and that the Father is already subduing. The author to the Hebrews tells us that this actually began when Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, and that he did 40 days after his resurrection. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 10, verses 11 through 13, Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. In other words, the, the Judaistic sacrificial system is not going to help you, can't save you, can't take away your sins. But he, that is Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. The Bible says that Jesus went to the cross and he died and he was buried and after three days he rose again. After 40 days he ascended and when he ascended, that is when he sat down at the right hand of God. That is when he was coronated. That is when he was crowned king. That is when he began to rule. And that's when the promise that all his enemies would be subdued under his feet began to be fulfilled. Now, you need to realize that Jesus was not promised just a people. We often focus on the fact that Jesus Christ did all this work and he laid down his life in order that he might have all those people who would trust in him to be his peculiar people, to save them and bring them to heaven, to build this house for God, that worship might be offered to him, this house that would endure forever, the church. But he was promised more than that. He was also promised absolute sovereignty over the entire world. Listen to what Paul writes in Ephesians 1, verses 20 through 23. He raised him from the dead, speaking of Christ, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age, but in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We often read this passage and we see the fact that Jesus is the head of his church. But the Father has promised, well, has made him uh, authority and ruler over all. That's why he's called the King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords is because he is in sovereign, 
authority over all of these things. He put all things in subjection under his feet. Now listen to this passage in Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because of his great humiliation, being in the form of God, humbling himself, emptying himself of reputation, taking the form of sinful flesh, and even humbling himself to the point of death on the cross, even becoming a curse for his people, for that great humiliation, the Father exalted him and gave him the name above every name so that every knee will bow before him. That is a promise that the God of the universe, the one who spoke everything into existence with a word, has promised to give his son for this particular work that he has done. And so Jesus is reigning now from the time he ascended to the present time, and he will reign until all his enemies are subdued under his feet. By the way, the Bible also tells us who the last enemy is that he will vanquish, and that is death. And that enemy will not be vanquished until he returns. 1 Corinthians 15, 25 and 26, For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. And that's the one he will abolish when he returns to raise the dead and to translate all the living and to gather them all together for the final judgment. So my point is, his reign is not future. His reign is right now. Right now, he is ruling over all the earth. As a matter of fact, as Psalm 2 points forward to it, all the nations, all the kings are called upon to submit to him. Otherwise, he may become angry at them and they perish along the way. When a nation is destroyed, it's because our Lord wills it. When a nation is raised up, it's because our Lord wills it. He's in absolute control of all things. And the subjection of his enemies, that's been going on from then until the present as well. The Lord is subduing, or the Father is subduing, all of the Son's enemies under his feet. By the way, that's where we come in. This isn't all just going on apart from us. The Lord is actually using us to bring this about. Because how does the Father actually bring about the subjection of Christ's enemies? Well, there's a variety of ways in which he does it, but he works primarily through the church. That's what the Great Commission is all about. Jesus said before his ascension to his people, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Just what we just read. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Lord subdues his enemies, primarily through evangelism and the work of missions. And he does evangelism and missions through his church. By the way, we were studying uh, spiritual warfare this past Wednesday through Pilgrim's Progress. His Christian is taken into the armory and he's shown the armor and he's also shown some of the weapons that the people of God used in their war against the enemy uh, years ago. And we're reminded that spiritual warfare is a part of every Christian's life and what the Lord has given to us in order to fight that warfare. Well, do you realize that this is the greatest part of our spiritual warfare? To fulfill this commission, to actually get out there and, and do this. I mean, what is it that's, that's stopping us from doing this? except the personal attacks that the world, the flesh, and the devil continually are prosecuting against us. We need to overcome these things because they're trying to stop us from doing the very thing that the Lord has commissioned us to do, and that is to reach out to the lost with the gospel. Because it's through the gospel that the Lord restrains sin. It's through the gospel he changes hearts. It's through the gospel that he advances the kingdom of heaven. I mean, there are certain things I believe the Lord wants to bring about in society, but we're not going to be able to force it on society. 
We don't have the force of arms to do that, and plus the Lord hasn't commanded us to do it in that way. But he has given us spiritual weapons of warfare. Prayer, the word of God, the gospel, and those are the weapons that we are to be using to, to bring about this transformation to advance the kingdom of heaven. So the point is, instead of looking for a future time when the Lord's going to bring his kingdom, as it were, in one fell swoop, he wants to fulfill this work through us today. And he actually does it through us in a variety of ways. I don't know if you realize this, but when we all gather together for worship, you know, we, we do use the means of grace, and that helps strengthen us to be able to do the work God has called us to do. But it also provides a witness for the people who drive by and see us coming to church. It tells them that at least here's a group of people who believe something of what the Bible teaches. It bears witness to the truth of the gospel. That's one way we build the kingdom, by being faithful in our attendance to be strengthened and to be a witness to the world. We advance the kingdom through our fellowship. As we've just seen 52 different ways in which we do this, we need to get together to build one another up so that we can actually do what the Lord has called us to do through our faith, through our love, and through our gifts. We advance the kingdom of heaven through our prayers. As we meet together on the Lord's Day to pray, we pray before the service, we pray during the service, we're going to pray again this evening in the service. As we meet on Wednesdays to pray, as we also meet in our homes for prayer or in private prayer, we ask God to advance the kingdom of heaven and to use us to advance it. That's how it advances. And of course, through evangelism, as we actually do go to somebody who doesn't know Christ and we invite them to come to church or perhaps we share the gospel with them there. We express the love that the Lord has given to us for our neighbors and even for our enemies by giving them the word of life. That's how the kingdom advances. So that's going on right now, and we're a part of it. And the fact that Jesus is reigning right now should also have a profound impact on how much effort we put into this and the confidence that we will have as we go out because Jesus says in the commission, I will be with you even to the end of the age. I will be with you to give you success in the thing that I am sending you out to do. Again, to extend his kingdom throughout the world. Now let me just point out again that our Lord Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. His Father is subduing his enemies under his feet, and he will reign until all of his enemies are subdued. Now again, every knee is going to bow to the Lord Jesus Christ one day in one way or another. And basically, those of us who have heard the gospel actually have a choice of how we're going to do it. We're either going to submit to what the Lord calls us to do and willingly bow the knee now in order that we might be saved. Or if we refuse to do that, the Lord one day will force our subjection at a time when it will be too late for us to be saved. And that will be, of course, on the day of his judgment. You know, some have seen in this passage as well and in this fulfillment of this promise also the idea, and I happen to be one of them, a more optimistic view that even before that day comes, the Lord will subdue much more of the earth and many more knees will bow before him. It's not going to be just on the day of judgment. But perhaps the Lord will pour out of his spirit and bring about a, a great advancing of the kingdom of heaven so that the nations actually are discipled and knees bow and the people of the earth flock as it were to Jerusalem to learn that law and they walk in the light of God's truth. But either way, every knee is going to bow either willingly or unwillingly. And so bow the knee now, willingly, before the Lord as he offers you his grace and his mercy and his love. He says that all who come to him and trust in him will have eternal life. He will take away all your sins, all your guilt, and he will give to you a clean record, a perfect record, a perfect record of his righteousness. The Father will adopt you into his family as his sons and daughters, and you will live forever with him in paradise. 
Now, you all realize as well as I do that life doesn't go on forever. You need to think about your future. You know, we think about retirement, but we don't seem to think very far beyond that. But we need to think about that. And just read the news to see how many people suddenly die and they just don't know it's going to happen. I just recently read about a five-year-old boy that picked up a 22 rifle that was his rifle, his toy rifle that he was learning to shoot, and he shot his two-year-old sister and killed her. About five women who burned to death in a limousine. Well, they were on their way to do something. I don't know what it was, but the, the car caught fire and they burned to death. They didn't know they were going to die on that particular day. There was a, a man who was in his 40s, early 40s, who was out coaching. It looked like a junior high soccer game and he gave a penalty card to, to one of the kids or put a penalty against him and the kid punched him in the face and the guy died. He didn't know he was going to die that particular day and you don't know when you're going to die. You know, things like this happen all the time. You don't know when the Lord is going to call you to account so you need to make sure that you have bowed the knee to Christ. If you do not bow the knee to him while you are alive and trust him and receive his love and his mercy, then you will bow the knee as the Lord, uh, as you stand before him as your judge. And then you have to answer for every single one of your sins. So bow the knee to the Lord. Trust him now. Turn from your sins now so that you will be safe. And by the way, realizing that's the case with everyone outside the church, your friends, your neighbors, your family members, don't, don't put off trying to share Christ with them. We always think there's going to be tomorrow. But you know that tomorrow doesn't always come for everyone. We need, while we have the opportunity, while we have the day, let's share Christ with them. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer. And uh, let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard in a way that we need to hear it individually.